Hello, and welcome to the Dark Ages podcast. This is episode 17, The Phantom Kingdom. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. I've missed you. Last time, all those days ago, I had introduced the Franks, who will be the last Germanic people that get a detailed introduction onto the stage of the Dark Ages podcast. I'll be leaving aside others just as deserving, the Burgundians, the Saxons, the Gepids, and so on, and we will have to catch up with the Ostrogoths very soon. But no more deep dives into early history. We have to keep this thing moving. So this time, we're going to come back to the narrative we left off in 456. We'll talk about that pair of generals who had toppled Avitus, named Majorian and Rissimer. We'll talk about the overall picture of the western provinces, which had only gotten more confused with the death of Avitus, and look at how those usurpers plan to make it all better. And lastly, we'll visit the curious little entity called the Kingdom of Soissons, as an example of how much things had changed and yet stayed the same. Avitus was killed, most likely on the orders of Majorian and Rissimer, in 457, a few months after his deposition. Rissimer was of German descent, maybe a grandchild of the Visigothic king Valia, and so he wouldn't be acceptable to the Roman Senate as emperor, so Majorian donned the purple. But it was a partnership. The two decided that Rissimer would stay in Italy and keep an eye on things while Majorian would deal with the situation in the provinces. Avitus' brief tenure had made it clear that there had to be a powerful authority in Italy to keep a lid on any discontent among the nobility. But the provinces couldn't be neglected, so Majorian would spend the next five years with his army, charging around like a blue-ass fly to try and bring some order back to the west. He wasn't actually acclaimed by the army as emperor until April of 457, and didn't receive recognition from the Eastern Emperor until December of that year, but there wasn't time to worry about formality. I try to not use too much technical language on this show, but the situation in Gaul was completely facacta. The fall of Avitus had deepened the gulf between Italy and Gaul. Both the Gallo-Romans and the Visigoths had supported Avitus, and neither took kindly to the news of his overthrow and execution. The Burgundians, who had been fighting in Spain on Avitus's behalf, also rebelled and seized Lyon. Possibly the Lyonnais allowed themselves to be seized, as inscriptions of the time indicate they didn't accept Majorian as their emperor. They may also have been distracted by various delicious potato dishes. Yes, I know that the potato wouldn't be known in Europe for a thousand years. Don't at me. It's a gag. A separate rebellion of Avitus' supporters took Narbonne out of the imperial sphere. The Visigothic armies in Spain were still loyal to Avitus, and factions among them were squabbling over the remains of the Suevic kingdoms that had been defeated in the previous years. And of course, the Franks and Alamanni living over the Rhine would take advantage of the chaos and raid westward. Overhanging all of it was the continual threat of vandal raid, or even invasion, from Africa. So Majorian got right to work. In 458, he repulsed an Alemannic attack on Raetia, and a vandal attack on Campania way in the south of the Italian boot. And so with Italy secure north and south, he turned to Gaul. Narbonne was won back fairly quickly and without any violence. The old supporters of Avitus lost their jobs but kept their titles and their property. Their jobs were then filled with men Majorian could count on. Most important of them was an officer named Egidius, who had served together with Majorian under Flavius Aetius. Aegidius retook Lyon from the Burgundians, also in 458, and reconfirmed them in their treaty with the Empire. And before New Year's, Majorian himself gathered the Gallo-Roman senators in Lyon and managed to talk them all around to his side. When he was filling vacancies in Gaul, he appointed Gallic aristocrats who had strong interests in Italy, which in hindsight is so powerfully obvious it makes a Vetus look like kind of a clod for not having done it himself. With that simple move, Majorian brought the Gallo-Romans out of the cold without alienating the Italians. Sidonius Apollinaris, our old friend, 
append a panegyric to Majorian, praising him for his energy and for not ignoring Gaul as his predecessors had done, very diplomatically avoiding the awkward subject of Sidonius' father-in-law. The Visigoths were a bit trickier. Theodoric II was in Spain when word reached him of Edith's death, and it took him by surprise. He had no intention of making concessions to this new emperor, whoever the he might be. Actually, he probably was familiar with Majorian from his time serving Aetius, but never mind. Theodoric broke up his army and left some of them to ravage the Spanish countryside and keep the Suevi from getting any ideas. The rest he took back to Gaul. Majorian wasn't interested in making concessions, though, and led the army personally into Gaul to meet Theodoric directly. The Visigoths were comprehensively defeated. All the territory they were claiming for themselves in Spain had to be returned to the Roman rule, and just like that, the Visigoths were back to being another federate army, a pool of soldiers to be called on to fight for Rome's, and not to lose his, interest. And also just like that, Avidus had control of the Spanish ports again. There is an excellent map on Wikipedia, which I'll link to, of Majorian's movements during his time on the throne. No beaver has ever been so busy, and his long-range goal was never in any doubt. In order for Rome to be permanently secure, the Mediterranean would have to become a Roman lake once again. As long as the Vandal Kingdom sat there, insolently chewing its gum loudly in Rome's ear, there would always be economic uncertainty and military threat. Africa would be the last and most important piece of the puzzle Majorian was putting back together, at his impressive pace. The ports of Spain would serve as the staging point for the great push to reclaim that rich province, the loss of which had stung not only Roman stomachs, but pride as well. So let's pause for a second and consider what Majorian has accomplished in, at this point, only four years. He and Rissimer had managed the usurpation in a way that avoided civil war. Majorian had stabilized the Rhine frontier. He and Aegidius kept the Visigoths in their box and retained them as a troublesome source of men rather than an active enemy. And while Spain wasn't exactly at peace, it was at least usable again. There was some hope that it might be brought back fully into the Roman sphere before too long. It's all really very impressive. Majorian is really very impressive. And he must have looked magnificent in 460, when he crossed the Pyrenees to supervise the gathering of armies and ships at Cartagena. Geyseric, still alive, still king of the Vandals, and by now the gray old man of Mediterranean diplomacy, hadn't gotten to where he was by being stupid. He could see what was happening. Not only was a force gathering in Cartagena that included Romans, Visigoths, and Herules, hey, remember them? Way back from episode one? But an army was moved from Dalmatia to Sicily, either to guard against counterattack or provide a second prong on the Roman assault. The commander of that contingent was a general named Marcellinus, and he will be important later on, so make a note. Geyseric was concerned enough to send an embassy to Majorian, asking him for peace. I wonder if that guy even got the first sentence out before he was sent away. Geyseric would have to try something else. And it didn't take him long to come up with something. A vandal fleet crossed over in secret, and caught the gathered fleet in port. Most of Majorian's fleet was sunk in the harbor. Commentators of the time loudly suggested traitors had worked from within to destroy the boats, and I suppose that's possible, but Roman chroniclers are always quick to tr cry traitor whenever the Romans suffer a defeat, as I think I've mentioned before. The truth is that Geyseric's intelligence network was clearly superior to the Romans, and even if Majorian had known of the Vandals sailing, intercepting them in an era without radar would have been nearly impossible and getting the fleet out of the way equally unworkable, without knowing where the Vandals were headed, and with no ability to stand out at sea for any extended period of time. The destruction of the ships in Cartagena put an end to the African mission. There was no time to commandeer new ships and no money to continue keeping an army waiting around while that fleet assembled. Majorian would have to make peace with Geyseric. According to Priscus, this peace was made on shameful terms, but we don't really know what those terms were. Possibly more of Mauritania was handed over to the Vandal King. Majorian shut the operation down and headed back to Arles. He had lost none of his energy, and from Gaul he issued decrees aimed at reforming the Empire's administration in an effort to keep what he had already won. 
it's worthwhile to give a couple of minutes to those decrees, since they give some insight into the situation in the empire as it was entering its death spiral. One law was issued that punished the practice of taking building material from public buildings for use in private construction. It also punished judges who approved demolition of such buildings. A great many works of Roman and Greek architecture are lost to us because their materials were scavenged for other later building. It is common practice in late antiquity, starting from the crisis of the 3rd century onward, as the cost of building climbed ever higher thanks to the increasing unpredictability of transport around the empire. The Vandal stranglehold on maritime trade was especially problematic. Archaeologists have a term for these materials, spolia, and it leads to all kinds of interesting inscriptions and even sp full sculptures being found in buildings that date to centuries or even millenniums after the original was quarried. The crumbling infrastructure and costs of transport are one of my personal hobby horses in the question of why the empire came apart, so this one is particularly interesting to me. Majorian was, like Augustus, concerned about the strength of the empire's families as well. The introduction of Christianity had led to an increasing number of young women being sent to take holy orders, often against their will, in order to avoid dissipating a family's fortune as dowry payment. Majorian believed that this reduced the birth rate among Roman families, and it's hard to see why he would be wrong about that. He also believed that the practice led to an increase in sex out of wedlock, and was essentially setting young women up for moral failure. So the law set the minimum age for holy vows at 40. It extended to young widows as well, so that they would have a chance to remarry and have children. Widows like this were often induced by their local clergy to take vows and then give their inheritance to the church. Majorian took steps to curb that clearly abusive practice as well. This wasn't all about strong families and justice for women. Majorian was also operating on the assumption that the barbarians who were settling inside the empire were producing more children than their Roman neighbors, and that in order to maintain the Roman state there needed to be more Roman babies. It's hard to say whether or not that was true without firm population numbers on any side. Personally, I doubt there would have been much difference, given that both German settlers and Roman householders were operating under very similar, if not identical, economic conditions, which are the strongest determiner of family size and structure. But I think it's worth noting that the Romans were clearly aware that things were changing within their empire and not necessarily in a direction they liked and also that the replacement theory was alive and well even back then. Plus a change, plus la même chose. Majorian took steps to tighten the empire's administration, too, and this was probably the least popular of his reforms, at least among the people who had a say in things. He forbade public administrators from collecting taxes, giving the responsibility to governors instead. These administrators had become notorious for skimming off the tax revenue for themselves and were publicly scolded for the dishonesty. He also reintroduced local magistrates. These had never actually gone away, but they were usually held by the same administrators who were busy skimming the population. Majorian's reforms attempted to remedy that. The kind of corruption and parochialism that these laws were aimed at was apparently widespread, and the reforms put more than a few noses out of joint. All the signs point to Majorian as an energetic and public-minded emperor, pulling together an administration that was heading toward an efficiency and effectiveness the empire hadn't seen in years. African misadventure aside, he was also a talented military man and a diplomat. Alas. The going theory is that many of these reforms would have been directly detrimental to the interests of the Italian nobility. A just and efficient government rarely favors the rich, and they began to plot against the emperor. First among these conspirators was Rissimer, Magister Militum and Majorian's erstwhile co-conspirator. Traditionally, Rissimer was motivated by jealousy of his younger and more powerful colleague. Based on his later behavior, it's possible Rissimer had expected Majorian to defer to him in the administration of the empire, and was disappointed to find that Majorian had a brain and free will. That can be such a letdown. On the other hand, the failure of the African expedition could potentially have increased Majorian's dependence on Rissimer, and all of the correspondence and inscriptions that survive from Rissimer's time in Italy are just as respectful and collegial as could be expected. The truth is really that 
Rissimer had simply come to identify more with the local Italian faction that opposed Majorian's reforms, and it had become nearly impossible to balance the various factions that all pulled against each other for their own aggrandizement. Factionalism tends to produce very deep animosities because it's so personal, and that can result in some really horrific violence. So it was with the case of poor Majorian. All in suspecting, he crossed the Alps with only a small unit of bodyguard. Rissimer met him at Tortona with his own men and had him arrested. Majorian was stripped of the diadem and the imperial robes. He was tortured for four days, and then on August 2nd, 461, he was beheaded. Let me pause for a moment and spare a shudder for Majorian. The people in this podcast are so distant from us in time, it can be easy to think of them as characters in a story or a fairy tale. Abstractions. But Majorian, and Rissimer, and all of them, were real men, and Majorian really suffered for four days before he met his probably welcome by that point, end. I think it pays in the study of history to put a little effort toward empathy now and then. Little preachy, moving on. Majorian was buried in Tortona. The Church of San Mateo traditionally includes his mausoleum, but the church was built in the 12th century and rebuilt since, so that's likely just a local legend. He was about 40 years old and had ruled the West for four years, and for my money, he was the last emperor who had even a sliver of a chance at putting the West back together. Rissimer put the imperial raiment in a box somewhere and did not raise a successor immediately. This was his moment to shine and he wasn't going to be rushed. Rissimer waited three months before he picked a successor. It's possible he was toying with the idea of just, you know, not. But that time hadn't come. Not quite yet, anyway. The Senate, at least, still required the formality of a coronation in order to willingly accept any authority, and were still equally unwilling to accept a German as emperor. Romanized Rissimer might have been, but to the conservative Italian Senate, he would always be a barbarian. So, what do you do if you want to wield imperial power, but you can't actually be emperor? Well, if you're Rissimer, you pick the least threatening person you can find and make him emperor. Make sure he understands his job, which is to do exactly what he is told, and absolutely no more. It wasn't too hard to find such a person among the senators of Rome, by the name of Libius Severus. Libius Severus is remarkable only in his status as absolute non-entity. We know zilch about his previous life, other than he was probably one of the old money chinless wonders of the Senate, and his reign was completely dominated by Rissimer. There were two other parties interested in how the succession shook out. One was the Eastern Emperor Leo I, also called Leo the Thracian. We've gotten away from talking much about the Eastern Empire lately, and I don't have space or brain power to rectify that now. Let's just leave it that Leo had succeeded upon Marcion's death and now advocated for one Anthemius, who was one of his generals who had an inconveniently strong claim to the Eastern throne. The other interested party was Gaiseric down in Carthage, who wanted a fellow named Alibrius to take the purple, as Alibrius was vaguely related to Gaiseric and would make Gaiseric the real power in the West. Neither of these two were impressed with Libius Severus, and neither would recognize him as a legitimate emperor. The odd thing about this whole thing is that Rissimer appears to have expected his coup against Majorian to have no real consequences. I think he fell into the common blind spot of believing that the opinions he heard around him were the same as the opinions of the Empire at large. It's especially baffling that he could have failed to see the problems with Gaiseric and Leo that would result. Maybe he did, and was just confident enough to believe he could deal with whatever challenge arose. As with Stilicho, the arrogance of the puppet master was reaching new heights. Some challenges Rissimer was perfectly willing to buy his way out of. The Visigoths and Burgundians were both ceded large swathes of territory and greater independence. Italy, then, poof, had friendly neighbors, for the moment anyway. But it was very clear that Rissimer had abandoned Majorian's goal of reuniting the empire. He had thrown it away in return for personal power in Italy. That would not go over well with everyone. 
Majorian may have been unpopular with the Italian nobles, but out in the provinces, with the people who mattered out there anyway, he was still the man. Most of them were not happy to have the Germanic kingdom suddenly re-energized, and those folks out there in the provinces were prepared to make their displeasure at Rissimer clear with utensils. First in line at the cutlery drawer was Agidius, whom Majorian had placed as Magister Militum per Gallia. Another one was Marcellinus, that general who had been all set in Sicily to support the African invasion, and who had since returned to his territory in Dalmatia. Both of these men made it abundantly clear they would be taking no orders from Rissimer or his dancing monkey Severus, thank you very much. They instead turned to the emperor in the east, Leo, and swore allegiance to him. I'll deal with Marcellinus some more later on. Agidius was in a curious position. He had spent the last few years attempting to reinforce central control in Gaul, and now here he was rebelling against the central control. His army was an assortment of regular legions and Frankish and Alan auxiliaries, commanding an area between the Loire and the Silva Carbonaria. A quick digression. The Silvia Carbonaria, or Charcoal Forest, was just that, a forest, located in modern Belgium and stretching from what is now Brussels down to merge with the forest of the Ardennes. It no longer exists in full and hasn't since around the 9th century or so, but a few isolated patches can still be found. It was apparently incredibly dense, with old-growth oak and beech packed so tightly that the forest was almost impossible to traverse, and so it often functioned as a natural border. This is hard to fathom now in the age of the chainsaw, but it wasn't that unusual. Similar forests once separated Brittany from the rest of France, and the Weald in southeastern England limited the number of available routes between Kent and the Thames Valley all the way until the early modern era. There ends the digression. I'll talk some more about the actual nature of Aegidius's control, but let's dispense with the chronology first. Aegidius was bellicose in his rejection of Livius Severus as emperor. He encouraged the Alan tribes settled in his territory to harass Italian trade and outposts, and threatened a full invasion. Rissimer obviously couldn't allow this kind of blatant rebellion to go unanswered, so he sent a fellow by the name of Agrippinus to deal with it. Agrippinus was uniquely well motivated for the job, since it had been he who Aegidius had replaced as Magister Militum of Gaul. Rissimer said to him, if you want your old job back, all you gotta do is go get it. Agrippinus was game, and knew exactly what his first move should be. He went to the Visigoths and offered to restore their previous independence, along with the one thing they wanted most in the world, a Mediterranean seaport, namely Narbonne. Narbonne had been the aim of Visigothic kings since their arrival in Aquitaine. They had held it briefly off and on, but now the port was offered free and clear in exchange for Theodoric II's help in blunting the attacks of the Alans and, if possible, removing Aegidius from the picture. Theodoric jumped at the offer. I mean, it was a no-brainer. It was such a no-brainer that Aegidius was across it immediately. He knew the Visigoths would be coming, and he could predict their route. Aegidius gathered his forces and headed to Orléans. The two armies met there in 463, and it was a comprehensive defeat for Theodoric and the Visigoths. Theodoric's younger brother was killed, and the Visigoths were forced to withdraw, giving Aegidius some breathing room. Aegidius would threaten repeatedly to invade Italy itself and depose Rissimer, but he never did. It's not really hard to see why not. The Visigoths had been beaten at Orléans but not neutralized, and there were still riparian Franks across the Rhine to worry about, and across the Channel, the situation in Britain had become unstable enough that it had to be considered a source of threat. I promise I will talk about Britain in this season, but after about 410, it's basically a separate entity entirely from the rest of the Empire, and I've wanted to get the rest of this done first. Don't worry, Anglophiles. You will get your fix. The territory Aegidius controlled is called the Kingdom of Soissons by historians, beginning with Gregory of Tours. There is healthy debate about whether that name is an accurate description of the situation. Aegidius was operating in a political twilight zone with threats on all sides. 
In his view, he was the representative of the legitimate Roman authority in Gaul. For the moment, that authority was vested solely in Leo in Constantinople until Rissimer and Severus's illegal regime could be replaced by a new, authorized Augustus. Regardless of its exact nature, the kingdom of Soissons would continue under the rule of a Roman until after the last Roman emperor was deposed. But things had been changing in northern Gaul. We can't really be sure about the composition of Aegidius's army, but it most certainly contained a large contingent of Franks, possibly a majority. Those Franks were led by their own war leaders, their kings. And that's where we come back to Kilderic. You'll remember Kilderic from last time. At least those of you binging in the future will. Those of you who are listening in real time who may have forgotten, uh, I am so sorry. Kilderic was probably one of the Frankish war kings who fought for the Romans in northern Gaul. His tomb was discovered in Tournai in 1653, and remains to this day the only 5th century Frankish tomb to which a solid date can be assigned. That date comes from the history of the Franks, by Gregory of Tours. Gregory is going to come up a lot in this podcast from here on out. He is the Jordanes of Frankish history and he was a participant and direct observer in many of the events he wrote about. However, at the moment, he is still 120 years in the future. Kilderic was before his time, and so, like Jordanes, he had to rely on the work of other authors. Those works are now lost to us, so Gregory is left as the only historical source for the story of Kilderic, king of the Salian Franks. Rather than try and summarize the chapter where Gregory introduces Kilderic, which isn't that long, I'm just going to read the whole passage. And this is from the Thorpe translation. Kilderic, whose private life was one long debauch, began to seduce the daughters of his subject. They were so incensed about this that they forced him to give up his throne. He discovered that they intended to assassinate him and he fled to Thuringia. He left behind a close friend who was able to soothe the minds of his angry subjects with his honeyed words. Kilderic entrusted to him a token which should indicate when he might return to his homeland. He broke a gold coin in two equal halves. Kilderic took one with him, and the friend kept the other half. When I send my half to you, said the friend, and the two halves that when placed together make a complete coin, you will know you may return home safe and sound. Kilderic then set out for Thuringia, and took refuge with King Bissinus and his wife Bassina. As soon as Kilderic had gone, the Franks unanimously chose as their king that same Aegidius, who, as I have already said, had been sent from Rome as commander of the armies. When Aegidius had reigned over the Franks for eight years, Kilderic's faithful friend succeeded in pacifying them secretly, and he sent messengers to the exile with the half of the broken coin that he had in his possession. By this token, Kilderic knew the Franks wanted him back. Indeed, they were clamoring for him to return and he left Thuringia and was restored to his throne. Now that Bissinus and Kilderic were both kings, Queen Bassina deserted her husband and joined Kilderic. He questioned her closely as to why she'd come from far away to be with him, and she is said to have answered, I know that you are a strong man and I recognize ability when I see it. I have therefore come to live with you. You can be sure that if I knew of anyone else, even far across the sea, who was more capable than you, I should have sought him out and gone to live with him instead. This pleased Kilderic very much, and he married her. She became pregnant and bore a son, who she named Clovis. He was a great man and became a famous soldier. End quote. One way of interpreting this very romantic story is that Kilderic was a war leader who operated within the Roman command structure, with command of the Salii as their, as their king and a place in the army as a federate captain. That wouldn't have been unusual, we've seen it several times before. The contents of Kilderic's grave, specifically the signet ring and the Roman military badge, back that interpretation up. It's also possible that Kilderic had his position from Agrippinus, the man Aegidius had replaced, and he found that he couldn't work with the new regime. Kilderic was then either forced to leave, as Gregory relates, or left voluntarily. It is equally possible, and indeed probable, that the whole story is fictional, and that Kilderic worked with Aegidius, 
with Gregory and his predecessors constructing the story about the coin out of confusion or to fill out a story about which they had very little information. The kingdom of Soissons is a point of fairly heated contention among scholars about on all of this stuff, so every point is subject to frank and full exchanges of views. Equally debatable is Aegidius' next step. Gregory says that the Franks selected him as their king. There's nothing to suggest Aegidius even thought about turning them down, but no Roman source ever refers to him as Rex. If that is true, and Aegidius did accept a royal title from the Franks, that is a huge indicator of how things have changed in the 50-odd years since Alaric's death. Then, leaders of war bands chase positions in the Roman military hierarchy to increase their own prestige and authority, and more importantly, win the right to draw on the army's resources to feed and equip their followers. Now, in the time of Aegidius, there are still Germanic war leaders who are called kings, but the scope of their power has changed and expanded under the pressures of migration and population change. Instead of chasing Roman legitimacy, here we have Aegidius, a Roman leader, taking a barbarian title in order to maintain control. If Gregory is correct, and the interpretation of events is accurate, then something unprecedented has taken place here. Maybe. Historians usually characterize the kingdom of Soissons as a Roman rump state. There is a romantic notion of this last bastion of civilization out on the edge of a shattered empire, but that might not be correct. Roman politicians had always shied away from the title Rex, for centuries. First, because of the memory of the hated earlier form of government, and later as a fundamentally inferior and subordinate to that of Imperator, the emperor. If Aegidius did take the title Rex Francorum, then that rump state was half a barbarian kingdom already. It had a holy Gallo-Roman administration, headed by a Roman appointee, but the appointee's authority derived, at least in part, from his direct relationship with the Germanic fighters who kept him in power, and who insisted on calling him their king. The Roman Empire fell when the authority of the emperors was transferred to the new Germanic leaders, and the people who lived within it looked to the newcomers rather than to Rome or Ravenna for protection. But every part of what I've just said could be wrong, too. Equally possible is that the Franks who had served in the Roman army remembered Aegidius afterward as their king because of the degree of authority and respect they held him in, though he never actually took the title. That faulty memory then would be passed down and would make its way to Gregory. Such is the nature of these post hoc sources. Everything has been passed down through at least one set of faulty memories before being set down in writing. No matter what he called himself, Aegidius fought the Visigoths along the Loire a couple of times, victorious every time, but never taking the offensive against them or against Rissimer. In the spring of 464, he suddenly died. If you count from his rebellion against Libius Severus, he had been the ruler of Soissons, whatever that means, for three or four years. It's possible he was poisoned, but like everything else in this story, other views are available. The kingdom of Soissons would carry on under Aegidius' son Syagrius until his death in 493, or 494. Gregory would name Syagrius King of the Romans, but again, all debatable. Some historians argue that during the time the Kingdom of Soissons really was a little slice of Rome out on the plains of Picardy, holding back the barbarian tide. Another interpretation is that it wasn't a political entity at all, just an army loyal to a Roman officer who was operating in northern Gaul as a warlord. So, king, general, warlord, who know? If any of this stuff was clear-cut, then this podcast would have a different name. Speaking of this podcast, apologies again for the long delay. The winding down of the school year has meant that there seem suddenly to be many more demands on my time, and I have not had the time I would like either to write or to record. I wrote much of this episode in my car in 20-minute bits while waiting to pick up my eldest from school. So I have to once again beg for your forgiveness and plead for your understanding. In the next episode, whenever it ends up released, we will leave Aegidius in the north 
and look down south at what the Vandals have been up to. And by Vandals, of course, I mean that grizzled old bear guy, Sarek. And by up to, I mean raiding and meddling in Italian politics. It seems disingenuous at this moment to suggest a visit to the social medias, as there hasn't been much happening on there for the last three weeks or so, but if you'd like, I can be found on Twitter or Instagram, at Dark Ages Pod, and the Dark Ages Podcast Facebook page is also available for your enjoyment and engagement. And if you would rather read the podcast, or are interested in exactly where I get all of my nonsense, transcripts and sources are on the website at www. Dot darkagespod.com. Thank you all very much for listening, and thank you to Sneaky Cloud and Goats314 for your reviews. Goats, I'm very glad that the transcripts are helpful. Sneaky, my family is incredulous that anyone could find me anything other than cynical, but then they have to hear me talk about current events, and you don't. For everyone else, thank you again for listening, and for recommending the podcast to whoever might be interested. Until next time, take care.